Hi everybody, my name is Tovio, and this is a galvanized study hall. Um, let me just make sure, oh, you know what? The description in the stream is not up to date. Let me just fix that really quick. It'll just be a sec. So I set up a new machine today and uh, things might be a little buggy, just a uh, fair warning. Um, you know, I just got uh, Conda environment installed and VS Code installed and, you know, we'll, we'll see if everything's working. I, I did test it out and it seems all right. So, you know, hopefully it is. Um, and... What I'm hoping is that if I change the description in this stream, that it will effectively update in real time. Um, there's a chance that that won't happen. Um, and indeed, we are not exploring a COVID-19 data set right now. But, um, you know, if we were, that would be cool too. Actually, if you wanna watch that video, um, it's kind of an introduction to Pandas video. And it's also available in the latent topics in data science playlist. And if you, if you are not, um, if you're not following the channel, please do. Um, if you Oh gosh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, yeah. If you want to be able to ask questions while uh, while we're streaming, we'll be streaming Mondays and Wednesdays at about the same time. Um, we might add another day in there at some point, uh, probably a Friday. Um, but if you want to be able to ask questions in real time, uh, go to the link in the description. Um, it's galvanize.com slash data science and slash prep and register for the basic prep and um, that will get you into our Slack channel, into our basic prep, DS basic prep is the name of the Slack channel, and you'll be able to ask questions of us in real time. Um, speaking of which, I just saw a question come through and uh, I'll go ahead and take that question first. Um, okay. Um, it's somebody struggling with list functions and methods uh, count specific items challenge two. So why don't I just pull that up really quick? And uh, then we'll, you know, in, in the general format of this is that uh, I'll do some lecture out of basic prep, um, just sort of working through the lessons and, you know, outlining things as we go. Uh, and I'll just take questions in real time as well. So um, let me... Uh, okay, <laughs> there's a pop out here and I seem to have forgotten that that existed. All right, um, it's always interesting uh, orienting, orienting yourself on a new machine and I tried to set this, set this thing up uh, to be very much like my other uh, computer and I think I did an okay job of that, um, but it's still taking me a little bit to, to you know, get used to it. Okay, so this is um, list functions and methods, count specific items. So list functions and methods, count specific uh, items. Oh, there it is, count specific items. And then we're looking at challenge two, I believe. Yep. Okay, uh, write a function called sample percent. Uh, that takes four parameters. Uh, the first parameter, obs list, will be a list of observations. The second, third, and fourth parameters are called group one, group two, and group three. Okay. Um, so starting off with that, we're writing a function called sample percent. Um, and sometimes I'll just, you know, if I'm writing something, I'll, I'll just get my loose framework in place first. Um, uh, the first parameter is called obs list or observation list. Um, and then we've got group one, 
group two, group three. Oh, boy, I'd like some word wrap happening here. Um, toggle word wrap, there we go. Maybe I'll back it off a little bit too, just so we can see it in one line. Um, okay. Uh, the second, third, and fourth parameters, and those are objects whose counts should be recorded. The function should return a list where each, oh, where the each, that's fun, um, where the each item is a percentage of the count and its respective group relative to the total number of elements in the obs list. So if I look at this, um, oh, okay, okay. So um, group one, group two, group three. Hmm, interesting. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I think this might be worded a little bit poorly. Um, this is something I'm gonna just take a quick note of and set aside, come back to it later. Um, actually, let me just grab this with, well, uh, I have a record of it somewhere. So um, let me just grab this. Oh, okay. So I think what this is saying is that we're just, uh, we're gonna take these groups. I'm, I'm not sure if these are meant to be single strings or if these are lists. And, um, because if these are lists, I would first extend each of these lists. Um, you know what, Let, let's just see if we can get some kind of output here that will be, um, you know, telling of what's going on here. So I'm just gonna print the obs list um, group one, group two, and group three. And let's see if, uh, if I just run this, if we get some kind of output. Oh, okay. Test list, human, fish, frog. Oh, okay. So in the test list, there's, uh, a certain number of human, a certain number of fish, or a certain number of frog. And we're trying to get the percentages of each. Okay, that makes way more sense. Um, all right, and counts should be recorded. Okay. Where each item is a percentage of the count of its respective group relative to the total number of events in OBS list. Yeah, this is kind of a cool problem. I uh, didn't, I haven't seen this problem yet. Um, we just added a whole bunch of new stuff, so um, yeah, I'm excited to kind of check this out. All right, so um, what would be nice is if we had a test and uh, if we were able to see exactly what is in um, in this observation list, but we don't have that, so we kind of have to, um, well, we, let me think about this. Hmm. I think, I think this is easier than I'm thinking about it. Okay, so what if we were to just say, uh, we're gonna have some output, right? And that's going to be um, we're considering this to be a list, right? Right, that's what we're seeing here. And uh, 0.5 is gonna be relative to group one, which is dog in this case, 0.25 relative to cat and 0.25 uh, relative to fish. So as we can see here, um, dog is 0.5 because it's two of the four items. Cat is 0.25, fish is 0.25. So if we, um, you know, we can do this in an incremental way. Um, I'm just going to start this off as having, um, well, no, I guess this wouldn't be incremental at all. Uh, we're just gonna count the items in the observation list and change these accordingly. 
So we're going to count by group one, then count by group two, then count by group three. And um, what we can do, well, if we're looking for a percentage of the total, then uh, we're going to need to know the length of the observation list. And, um, you know, we could do this here, just len of obs list. Uh, but I'll probably uh, refactor this a little bit in just a second. So I'm going to say output uh, sub zero is going to get the count of uh, group one. So this is going to be the observation list dot count of group one. And we can just do this three times. And we'll change, in this case, we'll change one to two, one to three, and this will be index one, index two. And I believe what we can do here is just, um, yeah, we can just return the output. So why don't we uh, test this with, with this really quick. And I'll print, print that. And let's just make sure that we're getting the sample output here. So Python and file name. So 211. OK, well, that makes sense because I didn't divide anything. Um, so I can just divide this by the length. And that should guess what we want. 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0.25. So let me just make sure that this passes our tests. Yep, that works. Um, so hopefully that made sense. Um, let me know if there's anything uh, that that seems odd in this for you. So let me let me just walk us through this one more time. Um, so we've got this example list, right? And uh, it's dog, cat, dog, fish, and we're looking to return something that contains. Uh, the percentage for dog, the percentage for cat, and the percentage occurrence for fish in this list. Um, so what we can, I'm just initializing a list here. Um, you know, I could have written this a different way, which maybe I'll rewrite it really quick just to show you that. Um, so output gets zero, 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 and I'm going to replace these down here. So output sub zero is just the count of group one over the length, uh, the count of group two over the length for that second item, count of group three over the length for the third item and that just gives us percentages across them um, if you wanted to make some really obtuse code uh, we could just do something like um, this might be a little awful but I'm gonna go ahead and do it so I'm gonna go I'm gonna make something a little bit unreadable and I'm not recommending you do this but I'm just showing you um, another way that you could write this and uh, let's do this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do it like this. And I'm gonna replace, because we don't have that length uh, namespace anymore. So I'll do that and Let's make a really terrible one-line solution. And I think this should work. And it does. And if I throw it into our, um, <laughs> I'll just throw it into here. And if we run it, I, I'm assuming this will work. Should be fine, yeah. Um, I'm not recommending you do it this way. It's a little bit not readable, but, um, but this gets you the same thing at the end of the day. All right. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, there's a question on here. Uh, what specs did I get on the MacBook? Um, did I think about the new ARM machines coming out? I did think about the new ARM machines coming out. Um, you know, I was actually looking at uh, the Serval from System76, which has a really nice NVIDIA GPU um, uh, 2070. Uh, they were releasing them with a 2080, um, and uh, they, I think they kind of sold out of their their design with the 2080s, 
And since I'm, I'm streaming quite a bit these days, I, I kind of decided to go with a MacBook and do all my GPU work um, in the cloud. Uh, it's so easy anymore to spin up. You know, I, I think I've got a, I can spin up a, something with a Titan on AWS for uh, like 30 or 40 cents a minute or something. Um, so a problem that would, you know, possibly take an hour or two uh, locally on on um, a GPU machine would take me, you know, maybe five minutes on a Titan. So I kind of just opted for that and, you know, uh, have this machine as a media machine. Um, yeah, but it has it has an i9, 64 gigs of RAM, um, has a, a pretty awesome AMD uh, video card. Um, I don't remember which offhand, but um, I'm feeling pretty good about it. it. It took me so little time to get the whole environment set up this morning. I'm pretty happy about it. Uh, usually that's, it's a pain. Even, even as easy as Macs make it, I don't necessarily follow Mac conventions when it comes to their opinions about how I should structure my files. So, um, but even, even still, it was uh, pretty nice. Um, and I got it set up probably in five or six hours, uh, finished setting it up right before the stream started. And I think I've got pretty much my entire environment set up um, aside from some database stuff. Okay, there's a question in here. Are study halls recorded? And if so, uh, where uh, basically where can we find them? Um, oh. Uh, well, I'll answer that uh, question first. Study halls are recorded. They're in a playlist for study halls um, on our YouTube channel. And we'll, we'll just, as we go, we'll just leave them there. Um, they'll be up indefinitely. So, um, you know, we, we probably won't trim them or edit them at all, uh, you know. But uh, because they're they're meant to be more live, but they will continue to exist. Um, the stream is cutting off some code. Let me check OBS. Oh, thank you. Yep. You know what? I was just uh, trying to get everything in place really quick that I did not see that. So let me let me see if I can get this. I think. Um, yeah, uh, let me know if um, if that's still cutting off because uh, I think that should be I think that should be it. Um, is that sizing working? Yeah, if if not, just uh, you know, uh, let me know again. Um, can just use the example given. Oh yeah, that's okay. Um, Okay, uh, list iteration, traversing a list challenge three. Okay, um, is that, where are we now? Uh, so I'll answer this one and then I'll, I'm gonna jump back over to uh, just working from, you know, uh, cause we work end to end from the prep, but um, I'll look at this uh, list challenge three under list iteration. List iteration and it's going to be traversing a list oh and um if y'all could uh if you don't mind putting in um the direct url uh when you post a question because that way i can just click to it i mean it's not that hard to to find it or anything but um it may, it'll just make it a little bit quicker uh traversing a list challenge three. Oh, okay uh cool so in the code cell below, use this iteration to accomplish the following. In a list called even nums, store all the even numbers from the original list, iteration list. Okay. Oh, okay, so we're not writing a function here, uh, by the way. Um, we're populating uh, a list called even nums, and then we're going to have even index. Collect all the values which are stored in the even indices on the original list, iteration list. Okay, to do this, iterate through all the indices that iteration list has. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, I'm just gonna disambiguate this a little bit. 
Um, like I said, a lot of these are new challenges, and I haven't I haven't actually seen them yet. So um, let's take a look at this and think about what they're asking. Um, store all the even numbers from the original list. So that's to that's one to one thousand by threes. So why don't we just print this um, uh, really quick and just you know get a sense of what it looks like iteration list. And um, you know it's what we'd expect. Goes up to uh, 997. Uh, starts at one, so one, four, seven, ten, thirteen, sixteen. Um, notice uh, our evens here, right? That that's going to be pretty easy to capture. That's just a modulo two equals zero, and um, we're going to store the indices of these. Well, that's going to be um, index one, three, five, etc. Um, but you know, we we could build a range to get that. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to um, actually iterate through this. So I'll say for um, num in iteration list. Oh, I need to I need to modify my VS Code to not pop up things every every word I type. That's one of the most frustrating frustrating things, honestly, for me in VS Code. I'm just like typing, and then I end up. <laughs> There's some auto suggest that um, ends up completing because I hit a tab or something like that. Uh, okay, so for each number, oh, I probably need uh, a list called even nums, and that'll be empty. So for num in iteration list, uh, I'm going to just say if uh, num modulo two is zero, then um, uh, then even nums dot append num, right? In a variable called even index, collect all the values which are stored in the even indices in the original list. Okay. So um, that's two, four, six, eight. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll just do idx num in enumerate iteration list and um, if idx modulo 2 is 0 if I'm understanding this correct um, I'll also initialize even index and I'll say even index um, dot append index. Oh wait, no, that append now. Okay, I, I think I think that's what this is asking. Um, and I'll just print the even nums. Oh. I'll accidentally open a terminal within VS Code and uh, even index. Okay. Okay, I think I think this is what we're looking for. But um, yeah, I'll go ahead and paste it in and see if I completely misunderstood the question. Oh no, that's it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, the first thing we're checking is whether the num, uh, the actual number, is even, and if it is, we append it to even nums, and then we check if the index is even and append that to the even index list. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump back to uh, going through these materials in order. Um, and as I said before, uh, you know, I'll be working end to end in this. So um, for some of you watching, um, you know how comments work in Python. Right. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to go through this stuff at a moderate pace. Uh, this is you know we've got a number of students who are pretty new to Python and um, getting them up to speed includes covering these materials. But feel free to ask questions 
and I can jump off and uh, after I complete a section, I'll jump off and um, do my best to answer uh, the question that you're asking. Cool. Uh, so comments. Um, there's two kinds of comments that we commonly use in Python. Um, there are block comments and there are inline comments. And is that how we're naming them here, inline? Um, well, either way, I call them inline comments. Uh, so let's talk block comments. It turns out that uh, a block comment can be defined in the same way as you define a multi-line string, okay? And that's with uh, three quotation marks, either single or double. So either this or this will work. And what you can do with this, um, I can say this is an inline comment. I can have it uh, span multiple lines. And with this, I'll say this is also an inline comment, um, but with double quotes. And this is nice. Um, you know, documentation, doc strings for functions are often uh, written in inline comments. Uh, and, you know, you can use them to create automatic documentation uh, through Python. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into that here, but. Uh, what I'm going to say is that if you want to, uh, you know, write a note to yourself about how a function works, this is going to help you. Um, so that's an inline comment. Uh, also, you know, could be called a multi-line comment. Um, now, here's an interesting thing. If I uh, name this multi-line string, I'll just call it that, um, and then I print it down here. Well, we'll see that it's it's just a string, right? And it prints in our in our terminal. This is an inline comment. Uh, I can have it span multiple lines. Um, it's also uh, just a string, and it works as a string. Um, good to know. Now uh, let's talk inline comments. So um, let's print. I'm just going to print something like uh, this is a thing I want to print. And I'll do, um, I don't want to print this right now. And uh, notice um, I'm going to need an escape character right here. So that's going to be a backslash. Uh, it's just because I'm using a, a single quote. Um, so print, I don't want to print this right now. Now, if I run this, um, you know, both of these are going to print, right? This is the thing I want to print. I don't want to print this right now. Um, both of those are printing, right? And, um, you know, that's, that's fine, but there are gonna be times where I don't wanna print both of these and maybe I'll just comment one of these out. Now, how do I do that? Um, on a Mac, I hold command and I hit slash and that'll just comment that line out. It's really convenient, uh, it's really helpful. Um, on a Windows or a Linux machine, it would be control and slash. Um, that doesn't work on a Mac, but it'll work on a uh, Linux or Windows machine. So um, if I want to comment this out, notice that it doesn't print when I run this, which makes sense. And you know, uh, we can use comments here to hide bits of code while we're troubleshooting. And uh, there are going to be times when you're troubleshooting where you throw a print statement in line in order to you know diagnose where something is going wrong. Um, you know, that's a fairly quick, easy way to do things. And um, you'll probably comment in and comment out that print statement. Now, um, I'm just gonna demonstrate commenting out all of this right here. Like you might wanna comment out a whole bunch of lines of code. Well, you can just select them and do command slash or control slash, and that'll, right? That'll comment them out, comment them in. Uh, now, reasons for using comments. Um, you know, sending a message to someone reading your code, yeah, there, there are times you're gonna wanna do that. And maybe just as, a, as an example, I'm gonna go to GitHub's sklearn, or sklearn's GitHub, and let's just look at some comments. Um, this is, uh, you know, sklearn, if you're not familiar with it, is um, one of the primary, especially in the academic world, primary machine learning uh, libraries for, for Python. So 
Um, their entire code base is exposed and it's great. It's really well documented, well commented. Um, there are uh, conventions in here that for some people don't look exactly like Python convention, but um, you know, uh, for the uh, data science machine learning world, um, this is pretty much the, the uh, de facto set of conventions. So I'm just gonna look into manifold learning um, and I'll look at uh, T uh, stochastic neighbor embedding, which is an algorithm I like. Um, and notice here, we've got a multi-line comment. Um, in fact, let me just copy this whole this whole thing because it gives us gives us good examples. Um, so just expand this out. Um, so here we're we got a the joint probabilities function, and um, we're passing in uh, some parameters. And note here, this is super helpful. Um, it tells us what this distances uh, parameter means. It's well, and and everything about it really. And this is done with a multi-line comment. We call this a doc string. So um, distances array. We're passing in an array, numpy array, uh, and it has a shape that is n samples uh, by n samples minus one over two. Um, the distances of the samples are stored as condensed matrices, uh, and you emit the diagonal and duplicate entries um, and store everything in a one-dimensional array. Sure. Um, then you pass in a perplexity measurement. Um, yeah, TSNE is really cool. Anyway, um, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, and then you pass in a verbosity level. Um, and it returns uh, a condensed joint probability matrix. Now, if you are looking at the TSNE algorithm, um, then these things are going to be... Uh, essentially defined in that algorithm somewhere, you know, in the writing on, on TSNE, whether that's in uh, a journal entry, um, if it's the original paper on TSNE, which, uh, you know, feel free to read, it's it's cool, you can find it on archive. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can see the, um, you know, how these parameters are defined and what they should do. And uh, you can see what the function is supposed to return as well. So, in some in some sense, this code is its own. Um, this code is its own uh, documentation, and you know you might not be able to get by with just the code and the comments as documentation. Um, but you know when you are when you've read the paper and you jump into the code, you're going to say, oh right, okay that's where this is happening, or that's how this is happening. Um, it, it may not give you everything, it may not break everything down, you know, but it does give you a lot to work with. And then uh, we have this sort of awkward inline comment right here, uh, compute conditional probabilities such that they approximately match the desired perplexity. And that's what we're doing right here. Um, actually, we're doing that Uh, I mean, that's essentially commentary on all of this, um, but uh, mostly that's happening here. So it's giving um, kind of a, a very brief statement about um, approximation, uh, uh, approximately matching the desired perplexity, if that makes sense, um, which is something we might not be aware that they're doing had they not thrown this code, this uh, comment in line. So that's a message to us. That's a message to anybody using this algorithm. So that's a really uh, pretty good reason to, to use comments um, between doc strings and other little messages. If you look through the sklearn code, there's a lot of really nice like, oh, we did this because of this um, kinds of comments, uh, like inline comments. And then the doc strings are usually really well, uh, well built out and uh, well explanatory of what the functions are actually doing. Um, I already talked about excluding some code from running. Um, and maybe I'll just demonstrate that really quick, uh, just to be. Um, let, let's just write factorial really quick. This is one of those functions that we ask you to just be able to write offhand. So I'm going to do factorial of n. Um, I'm going to make a product, and for um, num in range uh, one to n plus one, I'm going to. Uh, multiplicatively increment the product by num. Um, I can make this two; doesn't really matter, but I'll make it two just to just to do it. 
and then I'll return prop. And if I run this, um, print factorial of, um, I, I don't know, uh, let's do five. Factorial of five should be 120. I think we'll see that that's 120. Now, what if we want to see prod uh, as it develops? So we know prod starts at one. Um, I could print prod, right? And then we're going to see everything it is after one, uh, all the way up to 120. So two, six, 24, 120, and of course we return 120. Now, um, let's say I just put this in there for diagnostic reasons, just to see what was happening or to watch this change. Um, I might comment it out, right? And this is a really common way to troubleshoot your code or to look into the innards of your code if you don't really understand what's going on. Um, oh, I, I talked about function class or module documentation. That's the doc strings we saw. And then uh, leave to do statements in your code. So I do this a bit. Um, it's funny, I, I do, I write to do's quite a bit. And then I discover later that they're not actually what I wanna do and I usually just get rid of them. But um, it's a fairly common practice, right? When you build a scaffold of code uh, you might come back in and do some stuff with it. And uh, so let's say in this case, well, let's say, I don't know, it's, this is a little bit contrived, but let's say that, well, I want uh, to optimize this to not do have so many iterations of the for loop. So I might say um, optimize for loop by changing start from one to two. And you know, if, if I'm gonna take all the time to, to write that comment, I might as well, um, I might as well just change this to two, right? Uh, but you can imagine there are situations where you wanna refactor something, where you wanna go back in and uh, really modify something and make it run better. And maybe at some point, um, well, definitely at some point, I'm going to uh, do, you know, something on gradient descent and you know, we can take a we can take a couple of different avenues in gra gradient descent, um, and uh, one of those will be focused more on a li linear algebra approach, and the other one um, would be focused on a more iterative approach. And the linear algebra approach is better, right? It's going to be um, computationally better, much better. So what I'm likely going to do is uh, write it in the more algebraic form that is more easy to understand, or the more procedural form, which is easier to understand and then uh, apply a, uh, put it, you know, then I can demonstrate well to do, refactor this to be a, um, a massive matrix, matrix approach instead. And then, you know, I can just uh, leave that to do in there and then come back and refactor it uh, when I have some time or when the need arises. So that's uh, some basis for the to do idea. It's just a note to yourself to come back and do something later. Um, you know, if you ever get around to it, which sometimes we don't. Okay, uh, there's a statement here, don't use comments to explain every individual line in code. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, it's like, if we're looking at this, it doesn't really make sense to say, use a for loop to um, uh, iterate, um, or to uh, get the multipliers for factorial, right? And then say, in this case, increment, uh, increment multiplicatively, if that's a word, um, the product, and then here, return the product. You know, um, we don't really need to do that because the code is already telling us it's doing that. Now, I say that, um, in regards to code that you're sharing with other people. If it's your own code and your, or if it's code that you are trying to explain to yourself, let's say you go somewhere and you find some code and you're trying to explain it line by line to yourself, this can be a good practice, right? This is, um, you know, if, if we take this away, if we take our code away, this is essentially, um, this is essentially, uh, oh, and uh, a design of some code. And we can implement this bit by bit. Um, yeah, uh, just don't, don't use comments uh, 
in code that you're going to share. Uh, don't use verbose comments like this in code that you're going to share. If it's to explain it to yourself, by all means, you know, if, if it's a good learning tool, definitely do it. Um, let's look at the challenges. How should you not use comments? Well, we just talked about that. Oh, there's only one challenge here. Awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's talk about printing. Um, I've already been printing uh, quite a bit and, um, you know, it's it's fairly straightforward, right? Uh, maybe I'll just show some, some other things. So let, let's make a variable x and put that at five and y. Um, and maybe I'll just declare these in this way. And uh, maybe I'll do, um, and we'll say hamster, okay. So um, I can print x, I can print y, oops and I can print animal. And these are all going to appear on separate lines. Five, six, hamster, okay. So um, I could do something like this, x, y, and animal, all within the same print statement. Um, and this is just a, you know, if you're trying to diagnose something and you're just doing something quickly, this, is, this can be a decent representation of what you're trying to do, right? So if I run this, um, Pretty straightforward, we just get five, six hamster all in one line separated by a space. Um, the other thing we can do, and uh, this is something that will come up later, is we can make a what's called an F string, and we can interpolate these values in along with the string. So um, I'm just gonna show this really quick because it's gonna come up later. Um, I'm gonna say the value of X is, and then I'm gonna put X in here. So notice this is just F precedes this string, oops. And uh, we have this kind of brace notation right here, and we can pass in whatever that variable is. So if I run that, um, we get a nice message of the value of x is five. Um, this is just some uh, operations. Um, oh, this is this is nice actually. Uh, it's a little bit of a trick question if you get to it. Um, okay. All right, so um, I'm not gonna answer these. Uh, they're easy enough. Um, if you if you get to these and you don't know what they are offhand, you know, just snag this and put it in put it in your code editor, whether you're using Replit or whether you're using VS Code, um, and you can just you know run it. And um, I'm not gonna print the value of z, which is what it's asking for. Um, feel free. To, oh, well, I'm printing the value of z here. What will this code snippet print to the console? Um, it won't print the value of z down here. It prints the value of z right here um, because the print statement is sitting here on line four before these other operations are run. Okay. Indentation. Well, we've been using indentation, you know. Um, that's just a thing about Python. Um, something uh, you might notice in Replit and maybe I'll just pull Replit up um, because some of you I'm, I'm sure are using Replit and uh, this is honestly a small pet peeve of mine amongst students. Oh gosh. Mm, well, let's try this. Okay, yeah, why not? And we'll make a REPL, Python REPL and Oh, this is perfect, yeah, because it's going to show us a uh, bad indentation, I think. So if I write a function, this is a function, and it takes some parameter x. Um, what we likely want this to do is indent four spaces. But look, it's indenting two spaces. That's criminal. Um, in Python, four space indentation. Is the, is the way that you should do it. So if you're using REPL at this point, um, I think you can just go to settings. And first off, um, if you're me, you're gonna change your theme to dark because otherwise it's like glaring light in your eyes all day. Um, you might even change the layout to stacked, right? So you get your terminal down here. I actually like it side by side here. Um, and then look at this indent, well, not indent type. 
indent type, uh, leave it as spaces. Uh, we expect spaces in Python. Um, when you tab in, it's actually giving four spaces, not a tab. Um, but your indent size should be four. And now when I do this, um, let's just, uh, let's say, make this an F string and say, yay, this uses X spaces. And then let's print. Oh, actually, we don't even need to print because we're printing within the function. Um, let's do this is a function of four. So we would expect this to say, oh, yeah, I got it. Uh, this is a function, or yay, this uses four spaces if I run it. Yay, this uses four spaces. So uh, big recommendation, change, always use uh, indents of four spaces in Python. And if you're using REPL, um, you know, just go to your settings and change your indent size. Okay. Um, hmm. Is there anything else in here that we need to think about? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, so the indents are meaningful in Python, and this is different from a number of other languages. If you've used JavaScript, if you've seen Java, um, really most languages, uh, maybe not Go, right? If you're using Go, I think uh, Rust, I'm not sure, but Rust also, I believe, uses uh, meaningful indentation. Um, if Clark's on the line somewhere, he could probably tell me because um, he's into Rust. Um, but uh, let's think about if statements, right? So I'm going to make x is 87. Mm, let's do uh, 84, actually. And let's say if um, x is uh, even evenly divisible, divisible by 2, then we do something. Notice that this this four space indentation uh, makes something live under the if statement, right? So we have an implication here of something being encapsulated by something else. So whatever we're doing in this moment uh, can only happen if the condition of the if statement is met. So if x modulo two, oh, whoops, this is uh, if it's even, um, print, and I'll just make an f string here, print x is even, and then I'm going to make uh, another one of these. If x modulo 3 is 0, oops, zero, then I'll just take this and I'll say print f of x is divisible by 3. And let's say if, um, notice these are not if else statements, and that's because more than one of these is going to be true, can be true. Um, x is divisible by 4, um, and uh, we'll just do one more. If x modulo 19 is 0, um, well, then x is divisible by 19. And yeah, I should say evenly divisible, but you know. So 84 is even, 84 is divisible by 3, 84 is divisible by 4. Um, so this belongs inside of here, and it's a nice implication, right? It just gives us this nice implication. Now, if I do this, um, it's uh, interesting because we're going to get um, the same results, right? Um, however, if um, x is not Evenly, evenly divisible by two, but it is div evenly divisible by three, we're never gonna get um, x is divisible by three. And let's just uh, prove that by putting in 99. So 99 is not evenly divisible by two, right? But it is evenly dis divisible by three. And what we're gonna see is that we are never gonna get this message that x is divisible by three. Um, we didn't get any message at all, in fact. So, um, we can see that this if statement lives, sort of lives inside this other if statement. And we get this um, belonging, right? And uh, the only way that we can get to this is if this condition is met. So indentation is meaningful. We see this in functions. We see this in conditions, conditional statements. Um, we see it in for loops, right? So for i in range 20, this print statement lives inside the for loop, right? 
And once um, this for loop completes, then we go back out to this level. Um, and this is interesting. This might even prove a little bit of a point. Uh, we're gonna get an error right here. Or actually, we're not. Oh, no, sorry, I is persisting. You know, I think I've noticed this behavior before in Python, and I always find it a little bit outlandish. Um, that I survives um, after the for loop because I feel like it should be encapsulated by the for loop. Anyway, that's a philosophical thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so notice we get this printout um, for all of these. And then uh, when we print here, we're actually printing 19 again, which is the last number in this range, uh, this range of 20, which is not inclusive of 20, of course. Um, but this lives outside of here, right? And so, you know, it's just keeping this in mind that after this for loop ends, then it goes back up a level, right? And sometimes we say this is up a level and this is down a level or in a level. You know, different people will describe it different ways when they're talking about their code. Um, it's referring to these as grouped statements, right? Like this lives under this. Okay. Um, ah, okay. This is a good question. Will this code run or will it result in an error? And um, I'm just going to point out that we've got this extra space right here. Python doesn't like that. And, um, you know, I won't tell you the answer, but I'm just going to say Python doesn't like that. Ah. Yeah, these are, these are fun. Um, I recommend if you don't understand these, just uh, look through this lesson. Um, but basically, think about this in terms of what does this belong to, right? Uh, what does this belong to? It belongs to this if statement. This should belong to this else statement. Um, but, uh, and, and this else should be in association with if. These are sort of at the same level of, run, of the runtime. And so this else being indented like this isn't meaningful and will actually throw an error. Um, also, uh, after this else, this should be indented. Something should be indented uh, because that's what Python would expect. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So now um, we've written a couple functions uh, today, but let's, let's write some more. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got this little section, your first function. And what we're, what we're, oops, let me just go back there. Um, what we're getting at here is you're going to write a lot of functions. And you want to get used to this idea of uh, taking a procedure and making it live in a name. And that function is the namespace for the procedure. So that may sound a little convoluted. But um, if you want some repeatable operation, you just need to give it a name. And uh, let's say, well, we've got this times three mod seven. Uh, let's not do that. Let's do, um, let's, let's make a function that you're going to see kind of a lot in instructional material. That is, um, I'm going to just call it say my name or say your name. Say their name. Let's say say their name. And um, we're going to pass in a name. And we're going to print. And I'm just going to do this in an F string. So say their name is, and then name. And now we can, um, uh, we can reuse this. And we can, well, I don't need to print anything. Actually, why don't I just return this instead? Just to demonstrate return. I think it's a little more helpful. Because um, we're going to talk a little bit about print versus return. Um, if I print the what this returns, it's going to return this name interpolated into the string, right? Their name is this. And let's say, uh, say their name and then um, Tovio, um, say Jonathan, um, 
say Claire, I'll just do that. And notice I don't have to write this chunk of code over and over again. I can just run this and I get their name is Tobio, their name is Jonathan, their name is Claire. Um, and so we get this reusable, repeatable thing. And um, that's nice, that's really convenient. Um, it's sort of like what we did before with factorial. Factorial just lets us, uh, essentially it lets us um, get the factorial of a bunch of numbers and that's going to come in handy. You know, there are going to be functions that we write where there's going to be some atomic operation like factorial that we're gonna call within a couple of different functions. And, um, you know, it's just uh, easier to think of it that way. So printing versus returning. Um, so notice here I'm printing what this function returns. If I were to print here instead of return, well, let's just see what happens. Let's see what happens here. Because um, there's going to be something here that looks a little funny. Um, it's going to print, so it's going to call the function say their name. And it's passing in Tovio, so it's going to print their name is, to is Tovio, which it does here. And then it's going to do something that is implicit uh, because we didn't give it a return, it's going to return none. Any function that doesn't have a return is returning none. None is the special data type that is explicitly the absence of a value. It's not like zero, it's not like an empty string or anything like that, it's, it's the absence of anything and it's explicit, right? So we're returning none here, whether or not we put it here, right? So that's what we're seeing here. What we're actually doing when we get back to this print statement is we're printing the return of this function, which is none, and that's why we see it here. So we're printing within the function, and then we're printing out here what the function returns, which is none, none, none. Okay, so um, these are not interchangeable. Uh, this is one of the most common um, questions, confusions that we run into. People will uh, try to print something to solve a challenge when the challenge says uh, return, the function should return this value. And they'll have a print statement. They say, oh, I'm returning it. Look, there's a print statement here. That's not what that's doing. It's printing. Um, printing is just putting something out to the console. It's like uh, sending something to the printer, right? And it prints it out on some paper. Um, it's not the same as the function, uh, you know, bringing the value back into a memory location. Um, say, uh, why don't we do this? Actually, this is maybe going to be helpful. I'll change this back to a return. Um, and what I'll do here is um, I'll say tov message, and it'll be that, and um, I'll just do that for each of these. And I'll, I'll obviously change the variable name. Oops. And this will be John and CLR. And I'll just print that. Um, so notice here, none of these others are going to print, but, it, but these are stored in memory. And maybe just to verify that, I'll say, um, what is the type of the John message? And what is the ID of the Claire message? And we're going to get output for all of these. Um, but only one of these is going to be this message. And, you know, what we see here, this Tove message has the results of calling this function in it. So when this returns, it's returning this into the namespace Tove message, right? And um, when we call this, it's returning it into John message, and we're checking the type here, and we can see it's a string. And then um, here it's returning uh, this into the Claire message, and uh, we're looking at the ID of that, which is the location in the Python virtual machine, um, or a, a virtual memory location in the Python virtual machine. So um, that's what we get down here. So printing and returning are not the same. Um, it's something that catches a lot of people up. Um, it's just, you know, uh, it if it gets you confused, that's totally fine. Um, but uh, try to stick that in your head. Um, print and return are not the same. Uh, let's
let's see. Okay, great. Um, and this is the first function it asks you to define. Um, and these are kind of nice. Let's, I'm gonna do this one. We're gonna write a function uh, which should take an argument x and return five x plus seven squared. And um, it's gonna be called func. Not the best name, but let's call it that. Um, this is your first function, or one of your first functions if you're, if you're just getting to this point. Um, and let's call that on x. And uh, this is pretty straightforward. It's just a mathematical operation. I'm just gonna return um, you know, five times x plus seven. And this should be squared. So notice my parentheses here. And if I print uh, the function of two, why don't I just print a few of these, three, four, and five. And there we go, 289, 484, 729, 1024. Um, so hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, that, uh, yeah, first function challenge. Um, I'm gonna take a two, three minute break and I, you know, grab some water and I will be right back. All right, so hopefully, hmm. uh, let me know if my sound isn't coming through. Um, I think it should be. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's good, all right. Okay. Um, there's a question in here. Uh, 
Okay, there's a question in here on, um, uh, let's see, the math module for Python for combinations. Um, there is a math.combination function offered in the new version 3.8. Using it in the challenge does throw an attribute error. Module math has no attribute combination. Yeah, uh, about that. Um, let's just uh, let's check the the Python version in this because I'm pretty sure we're on. Um, you know, I'll double check this, but I think we're on three seven four. Um, and I'll, I'll just put in a question to one of my teammates on that. Um, yeah, so if there if there is a combinations function in the math module, um, here, let's see if our error will actually give us the version. Mm, nope, this error doesn't give us uh, the Python version. Um, yeah, if if uh, if that combinations function is new in Python 3.8, then it wouldn't be available. Um, so that would make sense uh, because I do not believe we're running 3.8 at this point. Um, I'm pretty sure in the DSI um, we're not using 3.8 yet, but um, I, I'm going to get verification on that. Uh, I don't want to misspeak. We might start using 3.8 before very long. Um, I know for myself, when I use TensorFlow, depending on the library I'm using, I'm often using 3.6.4. Um, it, it depends on what I'm using though. So um, what you're going to find is that there are a lot of different versions uh, for different things that you're going to want to do. Um, and kind of the more esoteric it is, uh, the more likely, or the less maintained it is, um, the more likely you're going to have to tailor your Python version for something. So um, I think I was using, there's a, a library called Magento. Magento, Magenta, Magenta. And um, yeah, I was just playing around with this pretty recently. And I'm pretty sure that I wasn't using 3.8. I, I built a separate environment or a different Conda environment in order to be able to effectively use Magenta. And I think that's because they don't yet support 3.8. I hope I'm not misspeaking here. They may actually support 3.8 at this point. Um, well, uh, long story short, um, yeah, I think this is uh, this has its own config, and so um, you, yeah, you sometimes have to switch your Python versions, and if something's not available, unfortunately, it's just not available. Um, oh, okay, uh, I just got word back. Uh, we're using in the DSI, or sorry, on um, the Learn platform, we're using Python 3.6.5, and that's why math combination um, won't work. But we're soon going to use 3.7, uh, some some flavor of 3.7. And I think that's where the DSI is at right now, too. Yeah, so uh, hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I know it's not a very satisfying answer, but... Uh, um, <laughs> that's uh, part of the nature of Python is that there's a lot of different versions of things floating around and sometimes um, I, I just really recommend building sort of uh, tailored environments to the project that you're working on okay so let's jump back into into this um, so we we pretty much finished this uh, we wrote one of these functions. The other functions that you're looking at here are not significantly different from these. Um, they're just different sort of iterations of the same kind of problem. Uh, so now we're going to talk variables. And um, in these earlier lessons on learn, we kind of go back over concepts quite a bit. And, um, you know, it's sort of like uh, 
you get your feet wet and then we go a little deeper with each thing. Um, that's what this is gonna look like for a little bit of time. So, um, you know, probably today we're just gonna get out of this unit and then we'll get on to, if, if you're new to Python, um, but you already know this stuff, we'll, we'll be getting onto something more interesting on Wednesday. Um, so what is variable? I think of it as uh, being a namespace. Um, that's what I tend to call variables. It's a name within which data or a procedure lives. So, um, you know, we can say X and Y, and, you know, maybe these are five and seven. And then we can do stuff with this, like we can print X times Y. And we can also print X plus Y. And this just gives us a lot of flexibility, right? We've got a name and we take a piece of data and we have our name point at that data somewhere in memory. And if I run this, right, we get 35 and 12. That's what we, what we would expect. Um, if I change X along the way to 12, let's say, um, then, you know, effectively we're destroying X and uh, giving it a new pointer. So if we wanna see that in action, I mentioned this uh, last time, we have this ID function and that's going to give us a memory location, uh, some kind of virtual memory location for the variable. So here, um, since we're destroying X, when we add, give it a new pointer to a, a new piece of data, we're going to uh, see a different ID for this. I should probably put ID there. And then, you know, we'll obviously get different results of these calculations below. So notice these are two different IDs and um, that's fine. Um, there is something kind of uh, interesting about this. So why don't I change this to seven? So now both Y and X are seven. And why don't I print the ID of Y and the ID of X and see what that gets us. Notice that these are the same ID. And that might be a little counterintuitive until you consider that um, there is uh, potentially, you know, a set of numbers that are going to be commonly used and you might as well always have them have the same ID. And, um, you know, so at this point, um, both the namespace X and the namespace Y, both of these variables are pointing at the value seven. That value seven is somewhere in memory. Now, if I do, uh, let's just do that number and let's see if we still have a consistent location in memory. And wow, it turns out we do. Um, that's a little surprising. This is not guaranteed. Um, I think the uh, memory location is only guaranteed for something like negative 110 through 111 or something like that. Um, I could Google this really quick. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm using, I'm stating the wrong numbers for integers that have consistent uh, memory location, um, but it just doesn't really matter. You know, um, it's it's something where uh, in this case we can't guarantee these will have the same um, uh, memory value, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, usually, we just check something's ID if we're trying to see if it is the same object in memory. Um, in this case, it is, but is that helpful to us? Well, I don't know. Maybe for educational purposes. Um, so, yeah, a variable just allows something to be reusable. And, um, you know, we can do whatever we want with, with X and Y at this point. Um, let's go ahead and run this and get this massive number. <laughs> I don't know, arbitrarily large. Um, so we just declared some variables. So um, I'm just gonna skim through this. Um, any any type of data can live here, right? X is a string, right? Or Y is 56, 586 that is, or Z is um, true. And, you know, we can even do something like say Z gets Y and we can print Z and um, it should be, well, you might, Think about this, okay, well, we're just eliminating this point 
this pointer to true in memory, and we're replacing it with uh, the value that y is pointing to, which is 586. So here's something. Uh, let's print z. And then after that, let's um, change y. Let's change y to uh, 56. And let's print z again. And what do you expect z to be? Interesting, right? So z is, z is pointing at what y is pointing at. Um, but it's not pointing at that same. Uh, but when we change y, we're not actually changing z, as it turns out. Um, we're only changing y. So we've attached the value here to, uh, to z. We've attached 586 to z. Not we haven't implied that z is pointing at y and y is going to point at 586 and then point at 56 and you know change z the value in z as well. We're not doing that here. Um, that's a minor point, but um, you know this is true of the scalar types, which are ints, floats, uh, strings, um, booleans. Um, in this case, we're not changing where z points if we modify y down here. Uh, I already demonstrated multivariable declaration. So x, y, and z, one, two, and three. And if we print x, y, and z, um, all, the way this works is one just goes into x, two just goes into y, three just goes into z. Pretty easy. Um, it, you know, it, it can make some nice, uh, easy kind of, uh, code writing, right? You just put everything on one line, condenses your code a little bit, makes it easier to read. Um, and of course we print one, two, three. And yeah, there, there's a multi, multi-variable here, uh, multi-variable assignment here, um, pretty easy. Um, question on valid syntax. Yeah, these, these are just, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, questions that I think when you get to it, if, if you struggle with any of these, um, you'll be able to just look at the text above and get to an answer. Uh, this is kind of nice, actually. Why don't we look at this? So let's see if this works. And let's print x, y, and z and just see what we get out of that. So this is kind of nice too. If you are initializing multiple variables with the same value, you don't need to do that on a separate line. X, Y, and Z here, X equals Y equals Z equals one. It's just convenient. Um, and uh, I think syntactically meaningful, right? Um, you know, because uh, you are basically saying, well, I want to just initialize all of these with the same value. And if you change them later, that's fine, but um, you don't need to use three lines to do this. So I've been using these kind of X, Y, and Z names. In general, you want to use a meaningful name in Python. Um, it can become really important. And um, the way that you name something is with uh, you know, name it meaningfully, right? So let's say um, weight of a cat, right? This is going to be some value, let's say uh, 11 pounds. And um, that is easy to understand. Now, if we were representing a, the weight of a cat with the value X and someone came across our code which was all about comparing cat weights, and we didn't say anything in there about cats, um, it would be it would be hard to understand what this code is for. And so, you know, err on the side of giving something a good name. Give, you know, even if the name seems a little bit long, um, it's better to have a slightly long name that means something than a single letter name or a really abbreviated name that um, is hard to disambiguate. Uh, so this would be preferable to this. Now, um, there's uh, a little blurb in here about iterator vi uh, variables. And 
when we're talking iterator variables, uh, we're most, we mostly mean something like this for i in range, and then I'm just gonna do 20. Oh my gosh, VS Code, why do you auto suggest so incredibly intensely? Okay, uh, I can print i here and watch the massive wall of VS Code suggestions come up. Um, and of course, this is gonna print i. So what is i here? Um, well, i is going to be the value, each value from the range in the range from 0 to 19, right? Um, that's all this means. So this is, uh, this is an iterator. This is the variable on the iterator. And we can call it i. We can call it idx for index. But I like i. And this, this is something that you're going to see a lot. Um, if you have what's called a nested loop, then you can just put these in order of the alphabet for i, j, in range, and let's do three. And uh, I'm just gonna print i and j. We know that the j loop lives inside the i loop. And, um, you know, we're not gonna get into this quite yet, in, into loops at all uh, for a little bit. But, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, for every value of i, we print three values of j. It's essentially what's happening there. Um, if you want to read up on um, on conventions in Python in general, uh, there's this pep, pep eight um, naming conventions uh, right here. You know, um, having descriptive names, um, all lowercase with uh, underscores, which is how I, you know, weight of a cat weight underscore of underscore a underscore cat. Um, make the names meaningful. It'll make your uh, life way easier and make everyone else's life way easier. Okay. Um, yeah, but this pep8, this is just um, Python, or what do they call this? Python, oh gosh. I mean, this specifically is the style guide for Python. I just uh, am having a hard time remembering what pep means. Um, it's something really obvious, I just don't remember. Um, but there's a number of these. Uh, the style guide is, is a good one to read through um, when you get your feet a little more wet in Python and you want to make sure that you're following as much of convention as you can. And there's just a few questions on here about naming conventions. Um, but let's not worry about that. Okay, so... Um, We've talked a bit about data types already, right? Int, float, um, string, bool, mainly those. And uh, we've talked about ways of finding out what, um, you know, what the type is of a piece of data, right? So I can say type of 21. This is a function I can use to do that. So let's just print the type of 21. And we're going to expect to see something that's integer here class class int oh uh, I've got a quick question to here um, I'm struggling with where to begin on challenge two of if elif else um, great I'll I'll come I'll uh, go through this lesson really quick and I'll get to your question right after that okay so um, type is one function we can use uh, another function we can use is is instance and what this is going to do is give us a true or false statement. So 21 and int. Is 21 an int? Um, let's go ahead and check that. 21 is an int. Now if I do 21.7, is that an int? Uh, it's not, it's a float, right? Is, um, how about, is true an int? True is an int. And this is a weird thing about Python that uh, there's a challenge where this will get you stuck, actually. Um, true is an int. And uh, that goes back to something I said before, where one is truthy, and or really anything is truthy, and zero is not truthy. Zero is falsy. Um, or an empty string is falsy. Or um, what's the other falsy in there? Oh. 0.0. Ah, uh, there's another one. I just can't remember it. Um, anyway, uh, don't let this get you caught up 
boolean true can be thought of as an int um but you know i don't i don't necessarily like that they did this in python it makes sense in some way uh in terms of ones and zeros trues and falses but um if you're checking the type of something and you want to see if it's an integer uh sorry if you want to see if it's yeah if you want to see if it's an integer just remember that true will pass as an integer in is is, is in is is instance okay um there's a question here is it bad practice to use variables such as um i num temp in python functions like they do in other languages like c c plus uh, plus it's not necessarily bad practice um you know single letter variables are not bad and uh it, it's more that if the variable has a meaning that isn't abstract enough to be held in a single variable, then name it what it is, I, I think is maybe the takeaway. I use num, I use temp, I use i, I use these all the time. Um, but I use them when I, mm, I use them when they have a specific meaning and I want somebody or I want myself to be able to go back through and read and know exactly what my code is doing without having to write con uh without having to write comments um okay so back to this is instance um this is just a nice nice way to verify the type of an object is instance is this uh you know is this an integer well this is a, not the best example but is 96 an integer we're going to get true out of this now the other way that we can do this, if we want to discover the type, if we want to figure out what the type is, we can check the type of uh, 96, and that will tell us that it is, an, it is, in fact, an integer. So we should get true and class int when we see this. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, take a question really quick, and... Um, yeah... And I'll see if I can give a quick answer on this. I think it'll be pretty straightforward. It might actually involve this. Um, so the question is, uh, struggling where to begin on challenge two of if, elif, else challenge. So let's just walk through this. On challenge two, uh, write a function. So we're gonna write a function called is, is divisible by, and it takes three parameters, num, divisor one, and divisor two. So uh, that's just a direct translation of what's being said in that first sentence. Um, the function is to check whether num is divisible by either of the divisor parameters. So is num divisible by divisor one? Is it divisible by divisor two? Um, and there are multiple messages that it can return. So it's not printing these, it's returning them. Um, and the way that we're going to do this is, well, I'll just grab these examples, which is always a good idea. If you're writing in a code editor, you wanna grab the examples if we have them for that problem. And um, that's just gonna allow you to run this. So um, the first thing you can do is, uh, well, I'm gonna put pass in here and I'm just gonna make sure that this doesn't error out. Um, notice every one of these calls to is divisible by returns none because by default is divisible by returns none um, since I'm not explicitly returning anything else. So I'm printing none, 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 none. Okay, so um, what we're trying to figure out here is, is the number divisible by each of these. Um, so I'm gonna grab these messages and my assumption here is that we, um, we wanna fill in divisor one. Yeah, we wanted to fill in each of these with um, the actual number right? And uh, there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, I'm going to do this the 
I'm going to try to do this in the easiest way. Um, oh, actually, uh, we indicate here a way to do it by using F strings, which I've been using this whole time. So uh, that's nice. Um, we'll use the F strings to interpolate these values. Uh, so maybe I'll just do that first. So F string, um, we know uh, there are going to be different, uh, I won't do that first. I'll, I'll do the actual if, if statements. So um, if num modulo uh, divisor one is zero, right? Then I want to return the f string of this number is divisible by, and since it's an f string, I can just use a curly brace here and have it be that. So um, if num modulo divisor one is zero, return the return this number is divisible by divisor one. And um, so we want to like pause here and consider um, the order of these. So if num is, divis is divisible by divisor one, then this is going to be re return right here. However, um, if it's divisible by a number by divisor one, it could also be divisible by divisor two. And really we should consider this number is divisible by divisor one and divisor two as the first thing we check. So um, I'm gonna say if num modulo divisor one is zero and num modulo divisor two is zero, then we wanna return this number is divisible by uh, divisor one. And divisor two. And now, um, now we can say, you know, else if um, num modulo divisor one equals zero. And I'm just gonna you know, then we can check that. So we have to rule out that it's not divisible by both first um, in order to guarantee that uh, if this is true, that we don't skip it because we've already returned that it is divisible by divisor one. Um, and I'm just gonna copy and paste code for the rest of these um, from up here. So now instead of checking for divisor one, we're checking for divisor two and I can just change this to curly braces here. And then if it's not divisible by any of them, I can just make this an else. So I can just return this. And again, um, I'll put in curly braces around, around this. Okay. And if I run this again, I'm just gonna run all these, well, I'm gonna run these three down here. Uh, we'll see if that works. So this number is divisible by three, um, and nine is divisible by three, but not by two. Uh, this number is divisible by three. Uh, 12 is only divisible by three. Um, this number is divisible by three and four. 12 is divisible by three and four, right? And this number is not divisible by either five or seven. 12 is not by five or seven. So um, assuming this will work, just copy all of this and paste it in. Okay, main module has no attribute five or three because I just pasted that into the wrong one. Um, here we go. This is the one we actually want to paste into. And let's see if that works. Oh, it didn't. This number is not divisible by either five or seven. Huh. Oh, I didn't make this an F string. That's why. There we go. That should, I think that'll work now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
yeah, it turns out that this is exactly, pretty much exactly what I wrote. Um, the, the key thing here, the tricky part here is checking for the case where, um, where the number is divisible by both divisor one and divisor two. That's really the tricky part to consider here. Cool, I uh, hope that was helpful. Um, if you have any further questions on that, uh, just let me know. Okay, uh, so we were just talking about is instance and type. So I talked a little bit about, you know, IDs and how they change. Um, we attribute this to an idea of mutability. Uh, oh, quick question on that last problem. Uh, it's, do you have to put the periods at the end of the F strings? Yes, you do. Um, it, Cause it's going to be, it's going to be checking for that as well. Um, and that's one of the things like our tests won't be flexible enough to um, where you can omit those periods. So, um, you know, uh, you can sometimes error out on a problem where there's some little tiny thing wrong like that. Um, so just, uh, you know, pay attention to those little things. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's this concept of mutability. And I kind of demonstrated this before, but um, why don't we just have a, va a variable and I'll call it um, changing variable. And let's start at 26 and let's print its ID. And um, let's modify it. So let's uh, multiply it by two. Oops. And let's check its ID again. So all we're doing here is modifying this and checking its ID. So we're changing where this variable name points to in memory when we do this. Um, instead of pointing at 26, it's going to point at 26 times two. And we're gonna see it has a different ID when we do that. And it does, as we can see here. So this might be a little counterintuitive, but we call this immutable, not mutable. It's not changeable. And what that kind of means is that this value, 26, we're not changing it um, to, 50, uh, to 52. We're not changing that value, that value to 52. What we're doing is we're putting 52 somewhere in memory and we're changing where this variable name points to. So it's first pointing at a value called 20, that is 26 in memory. And then we destroy that pointer. We destroy that little slip of paper that says where uh, 26 is located. And we instead put a piece of paper in there that says where 52 is located. And that's why we see this ID change. We call this immutable. It's a non-mutable type. It's an immutable type. And so there are other types in Python that are mutable. They are changeable. Um, and those are generally collection types, types that can store more than one value. And we looked at a couple of those in examples today, like a list. A list is um, a data structure that can store immutable types like these. Um, and I'll just demonstrate this, um, call this demo list, or let's call this changing list. And uh, you may not have seen this yet if you're new to this, but I'm going to change the value at this location. And I'm gonna change it to 999. And uh, as we did before, I'm gonna print the ID of changing list, uh, both here and here. And even though I'm changing a value, a, an immutable value in this list, um, notice the ID when I run this. It's the same ID. It's the same list. And you can think about this sort of as being, well, a list in each of those, these locations has a pointer to a different value. Now, those pointers may change, but the list is still the same list which is a location, it's a, it's a location in memory that has a bunch of pointers to other locations in memory. And so when we change a value here, um, 
when we change one of these values, we're not actually changing the list itself. We're just changing a value within it. So mutability is a pretty deep concept, um, but uh, how do I say this? It has some implications. So notice here I changed this value. Now, um, if I have some string and I just have animals in here, um, I can look at some string, I can look at the uh, third letter in it. And if I print that, we can see that I am looking at the letter that we expect to be looking at at this point, which is the letter I. It's the third letter, A and I. Um, some string sub two, that's index zero, zero, index zero, zero, uh, sorry, index zero, index one, index two. That's the letter I. Now, uh, notice up here I changed the thing at index two. And here's something about mutability. I'm going to try to change index two, or the third letter, I, and I'm going to try to change it to an L. So it'll be animal moles, right? And that seems like a reasonable thing to do, maybe. I mean, aside from the spelling, it seems reasonable, right? I should, if I could do that to a list, couldn't I do this to this string? So let's see what, it, what happens. I get an error. String object does not support item assignment. I can't change the string. I can't change it. And that's because it is a scalar type in Python. It is It has a single value, and that value is immutable. So I can't actually change it. Um, what I could do is, uh, you know, I could replace this letter and make a new string. I could do something like that. But I cannot actually modify the string itself as I'm trying to do here on line 11. So that's because it's unchangeable, it's immutable. Uh, and in general, um, the general statement here is the basic scalar types are immutable. Um, that's floats, ints, booleans, strings. You can't change them. Um, you can destroy them and make them point at some other value, but you cannot change them. Yeah, and I think all these, these challenges are pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, function parameters. So I think we already pretty much covered this. And uh, like I said, some of these lessons are sort of reviews. They kind of circle back in a spiraling way. Um, all a function parameter is, uh, remember when I wrote factorial? and I'm writing the factorial of some number, the parameter is that number. It's a sort of, uh, it's, it's a placeholder for a value that you're going to use within the function. Um, when, we, when we define it here, we call this a parameter. However, um, you know, when we call it, we pass in, I'll just write this really quick for i in range, uh, num plus one, oh, these messages, they, oh, why? Okay, they just stand in the way of code. I don't know why anybody would want that to happen. Um, I'm going to turn it off in a bit, but you know. Um, <laughs> here, yeah, I'll just I'll just finish writing this before I turn it off. I can live with it for a few more minutes. Um, and oh, see, you see that? It just filled it in. It filled in ID as if that's okay. Yeah, VS Code. It's, you know, I like VS Code, but it's sort of like Microsoft came in and said, hey, I think you want this too. And you're like, I don't think I do. And they're no, 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 trust us. You, you definitely want this. It's like, uh, okay. Um, factorial of five, which should get us 120. Oh, for I in range, for I in range. Okay, uh, we got zero because unlike last time, I didn't start at one, I started at zero, anything times zero is zero, and 120. So um, this is a parameter at this point, right? This is a parameter. 
and what we pass into it is an argument to the parameter. So factorial of five, five is an argument to the parameter num. And uh, this is just semantics, right? But when you talk about these things, if you don't use the right semantics, people um, might take it as you not knowing, right? So um, it can be important. We write a little bit about this, um, but uh, just remember that a parameter is within the function definition that we're seeing on line one here. And the argument is what we pass into the function, which we're seeing on line nine here. Okay. Um, cool. And those challenges look pretty reasonable, so I'll leave those where they are. Okay. Um, variable scope. This is something, um, I'm not gonna dig too far into this, but uh, but let, let's just consider a couple things here. So um, I'm gonna make a function, x plus two, which is gonna take, gonna take an argument x. Um, our parameter name is x, uh, but when, I, I don't know, it's, again, it's a semantic thing. I'll, I'll just try to be more consistent than that. Um, uh, x plus two has a single parameter x, and we're going to return x plus two. And so, you know, pretty pretty easy to consider what this is gonna be, x plus two of um, four. We should expect to see six here. I think we will. We get six. And um, so now what if um, we define an x out here? Actually, let's change this to x plus y. And let's define a y out here. Y, and let's say it's five. And it, you might have just noticed I said out here and in here. So I think of this as being in the function x plus y because it's indented in, right? We talked about this a bit before. Um, so um, instead of x plus two, we're gonna return x plus y. And I don't think it's too surprising that we see nine, right? It's X, which is what we pass in here, which is four plus Y, which we've defined out here as being five. Now, if I pass in two things, are we gonna get nine or are we gonna get 10 here? Um, and you know, just as a quick aside, you kind of want to avoid stuff like this a little bit where uh, you get collisions. Um, but this is not a collision. This is just going to, um, one value of y is going to override the other. And it seems reasonable that this value of y is going to be taken from the parameter, right? So we pass in this argument six to the parameter y, and the y in here is now reflective of this. Now what happens if we print y out here? What would you expect y to be? It's still five, okay? It's still five. And if we, even if we move this below here, what, what might we expect to see? It's still five. Um, and that's because the scope of these variables, x and y, these are defined, these parameters are defined in here. The scope of these variables, um, these namespaces are essentially destroyed after this function finishes running. And this namespace is outside the function, right? It is outside the function, therefore it is what we see after this function completes running. So I hope that, that makes sense. Um, this is, uh, we call this the local scope as, as we say right here. And essentially, this is the global scope out here. Um, this, uh, this is global, it makes sense, it's outside. Uh, this is local, that makes sense, it's within the function, which we can see through indentation and uh, through these parameters being defined explicitly in the definition of the function. Let's see if we talk about... Um, <laughs> okay. Um, there's something here called messing with globals, and I'm not going to go into it because you you should just try to avoid this. 
I mean, that's the short story. Um, if you can avoid using something in global scope, avoid it. Um, now, this should work uh, either way. Um, oh no, it won't. Actually, you're gonna modify the global X when you when you utilize it this way. And so when you're saying X plus gets N, you're actually modifying X in this case. Um, it gets confusing and it's usually unnecessary. So, um, you know, not as a hard and fast rule, but, um, you know, avoid global unless you really think it's going to be meaningful for you. Okay. Anything else in here? I think that's the heart of this. And, um, and we don't have a challenge here on global. I think that's purposeful. Um, I think it's best to not really mess with it if you can help it. Um, oh, cool. So I think, yeah, yeah. So now we're looking at, um, at scalar types. And I think this is nice because uh, we can kind of breeze through this. Um, we've already seen the scalar types, um, but, you know, let's just look at them again and talk about them very briefly again. Um, we've got integers, floats, bools, strings, and nuns in this unit. And, you know, integers, these just are whole numbers, right? Um, so some int is going to be 56. Some float these are decimal numbers. Some float is going to be 72.3, right? Um, some, what was the other one uh, that we talked about, bool, is going to be um, true, right? Another bool is gonna be false. Uh, these are the only possible values for bools, true or false. Um, there's only two potential values there, uh, and they are very powerful, and also strings, some string, I'm a string. You can define strings with single quotes or double quotes or triple single quotes or triple double quotes. Although if you use uh, triple quotes, um, just keep in mind that you can have a new line, right? And the last type, is none, which is an explicit statement that there is an absence of a value. Um, this is not the same as zero. It's not the same as an empty list or an empty string. It's literally, there's nothing there. Um, and you can't perform mathematical operations. You can't, uh, there's a lot of things you can't do with this. Um, but what you can have it be is a placeholder for a value that you'll replace later. Okay. Um, I think because I covered these earlier, I'm not going to go back over them um, unless there's a specific question on any one of these. But um, these are sort of, uh, you know, circling back to what was covered in Python basics. And um, I think we can leave them uh, as they are. They're fairly easy to get through. And they're mostly just to drill in those fundamental fundamentals. Uh, basic operators. Now, we talked about most of these. Ah, uh, no, we talked about all of them. So again, this is, this unit really just circles back into um, what we saw in Python basics. And so, you know, if you feel you need the practice um, or you want to just, you know, solidify those things, by all means work through them. Or if you're completionist, by all means work through them. Um, but I think we can move on to control flow. And we've done a bit of this. Well, we did a bit of this today. Um, just if, elif, and else. And this is kind of where we see um, the power of Booleans. So I'm going to say if true. Okay, if true. Now, 
this is always going to run in my code. If true, print this will always run. If I run, oops, if I run this, of course it prints this will always run. Now, if false, it says this will always run, but I think it's lying to me. Nothing happened, right? No, no print statement was performed. And really all this is, is, um, well, let's, let's do something numeric here. Let's do X is um, 27. And let's say if X modulo three is zero, print, let's just print uh, some mathematical operation. X times um, 63. Um, else print x. And on our first pass of this, well, we're going to perform, uh, you know, x times 63 because 27 is in fact divisible by 3. What we aren't going to do is print out 27 on line 6 there. We're not going to do that because it's either one or the other when we use if and else. Um, now, we could use two if statements, right? We could say, if this is true, then do this. And then again, we could say, if x modulo 9 is 0, then we can do this. And, um, you know, then we're printing both things. Uh, these two if statements are not related to each other. Um, this is going to run independently of this uh, and vice versa. So, um, what we could do is put an elif in there and, you know, uh, maybe to be less confusing, if x modulo two is zero, print x. Now, um, if this is true, then this elif will never happen. In fact, however many elifs we have, uh, it's not going, none of them will happen in this structure. So print, I'll just do x times 5, and then else print what number are you? And the point here is that this, this is going to be true. And if you have this if elif structure, you will never, uh, you know, if one of these is true, none of the others will perform. Okay. Um, let's change this to 28 and see what we get. Well, then we're just going to run this one, but we're not going to run any of the others because none of those others are true. So um, hopefully that makes sense for, for if else, if elif else. Um, in general, we call this control flow, right? We're controlling, controlling the flow of our program, control flow. Um, and uh, this can get pretty complex, but it's uh, you know something that you're going to use all the time. So we have something in here, uh, branching statements. And I think um, I think I'll leave it at that. So we'll come back and we'll look at branching statements. Um, essentially, we'll make more complex if else statements when we uh, when we get together on Wednesday. Um, you know, the, this is pretty. Uh, this is already getting. This has some complexity, right? Because we're we have some sort of expression here, some comparison between um, you know x modulo five and zero, right? That um, that we're making, and you know we already see a level of complexity. You, you might want to just imagine that this can become much, much more complex and we can check a lot more things. But we'll, we'll come back on this one. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, check back in on this on Wednesday and we'll go from there. So uh, yeah, thanks, for, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, uh, if I didn't get to your question, um, double check and see that you that you posted it in the thread uh in general um i'm not going to answer 
well, I'm not gonna see them is the thing. I'm not gonna see uh, questions that are not posted in the thread for this, um, for our study hall, which is in the DS basic prep um, under my at channel post for the study hall. Um, you know, so just keep that in mind. If you have questions that if you post in the channel or you post in a different channel, I'm probably not gonna see it. Um, but yeah, thanks so much. And if you're in class, I'll see you tomorrow. And uh, if you're in basic prep or if you're tuning in, I will see you on Wednesday at the same time. Um, that time is uh, 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, what is that? 6 p.m. Eastern. So, all right. Enjoy your day.